Amanda, thank you so much. I think we've been going for 20 minutes now. <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> finally been able to hit record essentially. Um Yes. But we've we've I think we've got some some path ahead of us in this oh we sure do we have a couple that's, paths <laughs> that's for sure but that first off just again thank you for for finding some time to do this and um and, and coming on i'm so excited to be here thanks for having me so it is and i mean we actually didn't speak it's your your birthday coming up on the weekend and you've, you've <laughs> you, i loved how you were i'm getting my energy i'm going out and doing my walk this morning and where did where did you go this morning and what so, i actually didn't ask where you are yeah oh yeah so i'm in harrisonburg virginia so can yeah, see wow. out there. It's a small town in the Shenandoah Valley on the east coast of the United States. So um, the geography is pretty prime for getting outside. It's super mm. accessible to the outdoors and outdoor creation. A lot of the community that lives here lives here to like professionally exercise yeah. <laughs> because it's like super affordable living, awesome people, and you have access to the outdoors. And you know, relative to like places like Florida or the South that are warm all year, like it's pretty mild here. Like we get snow, so you get to do multiple outdoor activities, but it's not frigid where you can't get out on your bike. So I'm in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I went to school here, moved away, came back and am here for good. Um, I just love working and living here. I actually work remotely. So there's nothing like keeping me to this area. It's just because I love it. And um, where I went this morning. So I actually decided to move the sunrise celebration, birthday celebration to tomorrow because the sky is going to be more clear. But my dog and I got out. Oh, I wish I actually can show you a, a really nice photo of our morning. We got out and caught the sunrise um, at our local oh, wow. People on our YouTube local will trails. Have to check that out. Yeah, it, it, we just it's so it's so grounding to go out, especially when you're you have a lot going on. And I think we can forget how simple it can be to just get outside, listen to our breath, move our feet, get in touch with ourselves, and go hang out with your dog. So mm. we ran this morning and um, we had a great time. Then I came home to like a delicious breakfast and yeah, talk about an energizing way to start the day. Let's just keep that rolling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's before we go into many of the different topics that we got, let's dive into your world of athletics sports mm -hmm. what for those that have not met you heard about you your world is in endurance and yeah what what got you into that like where did that start for you well I was one of those swimmers growing up the like dedicated committed 24 7 swimming like I since the age of four I was a year-round swimmer so I spent my entire life going to practice twice a day two hours each like I was Amanda the swimmer and so that was, that was like my gateway into <laughs> endurance movement, except that now I'm, I'm the opposite of specializing in one thing. I do a lot of different sports. And I mean, what got me to that was I spent my whole life specializing in one thing. I did play soccer for a long time and I always loved running and I loved doing all these things, but like we, we were told like when we, when I grew up in athletics, I'm turning 28 tomorrow. So it was a little bit of a different generation. Um, you could only do one thing and you had to focus on that, or you were not dedicated to that sport. And so I really prided myself on that. Like I, I knew that that was something I wanted to do through college. And I went on to swim at James Madison, which is a division one um, school here, actually in Harrisonburg. And I swam breaststroke. So I was a breaststroker on that team, but it was during my junior year. I actually had, um, I tore both my labrums in my hip and I had to get surgery and I wasn't really sure if I was going to be able to continue swimming because I, I don't know how familiar I was swimming, but the breaststroke is the one with like the frog feet. Yep. So it is like super demanding on your hips. And that was an incredibly tough time for me having something that I identified as I did my whole life and all I knew. And it was like immediately snapped for me. Mm. Um, so I definitely spiraled into, you know, I had, I really had a hard time mentally um, wrapping my head around that and being like, well, like, what am I now? Like, who am I going to be? What am I going to do? How old, how old are you there? So I'm 28 now. I was then I was, it was after my sophomore year of college. So I was about 20, 20 ish, 21. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's, it's not teens. It's actually, yeah, a little bit, a mm -hmm. little bit older. And and this yeah. is where, so sorry, I, I just wanted to get an understanding of yeah. where that, that, what age you were at, where you were starting to have these emotions and feeling that. College, like when I was in college mm -hmm. and so many athletes experience this post, like when they retire, 
Like, it's like the same thing that people go through after the Olympics, after they finish their career in college and they're trying to understand who they are in this world. And I'm so fortunate. I actually was, I was forced to face that while I was in school. Um, so I spent that summer couch bound and had a lot of time to think. And I kind of put all that energy of what I would always expend physically into like mental stimulation. And I ended up like starting a food truck and traveling and doing all these bigger things and realized, wow, oh my gosh, I love all these things just as much as I love swimming. I just never knew that because all I did was swim. And so I found all these things I was passionate about. And um, yeah, I ended up being able to return to sport. Very fortunately, had the great season after that. Um, I took a red shirt year that year. I traveled to the Philippines. I, I studied exercise physiology over there. We like hiked volcanoes and scuba dived and went into rainforests. And I just found all these other ways that I took that energy I was putting into swimming and found another outlet. Um, but I, I, re I really learned from that experience that I was so much more than an athlete. And so when I graduated from college, I studied exercise science and I finished swimming. I immediately went into triathlon. Um, I always loved swimming and I'm, it's very rare to find a swimmer who still loves swimming because unfortunately so much of that culture really burns you out. It really like takes the joy out of it because it's, it's so demanding on you and you're just staring at a black line <laughs> and mm. it's hard. And some, some of that co co like coaching culture falls into that. Um, just a little bit of the culture of swimming isn't, isn't so kind to longevity. <laughs> And um, so right after I graduated college, I went into triathlon that started as road triathlon. So I learned how to ride a bike for the first time. I got into running more miles and I kept swimming and I loved what it felt like to be a beginner, to like start something new. Cause I spent my, my whole life specializing in something and turned out I was good at it too. Like I was able to get on the United States the travel team and go to Switzerland. And um, I had a lot of fun with it. It, what changed a little bit for me though, was as I started to dive into these new sports, I, I just realized how much more was out there. And especially during the pandemic, when races got canceled, I had to find, like, I wasn't, I was no longer doing this to race anymore. Like I was just doing this because I loved it. And so I was introduced to the trails and that's when I got into ultra running and mountain biking and these like off-road triathlon stuff. And, um, yeah, Ever since that, I've just found so many more ways to challenge myself and connect and using nature as a tool for that too. So I've had a lot of evolution over the past couple of years with my relationship to sport. And I, I just wanted to keep evolving for life. I find it so powerful. So yeah, that's a little bit about like how I exist within the sports world right now. Yeah. And I want to go back to something you just really quickly touched on, which was you had this beginner's mindset mm -hmm. and I've brought it about I've brought it up a couple of times in previous episodes mm -hmm. and I'm really fascinated by athletes' willingness to do this, but also a lot of athletes' unwillingness to do that because I believe it is one of the crucial elements, especially in a young person's world, to be able to develop a new skill, develop a new mindset, develop any sort of realm of 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 any branch of your sporting and upbringing, it's a real important part of that. So I think it's quite rare that people can easily go into it. I think you you tend to have to be coached to go through something like that. Have you, Obviously, this podcast was actually set up by Caroline Burke, where she introduced <laughs> us and she was brilliant. And, and I know you're a part of the Rise Athletes Mentorship mm -hmm. Program, which is an incredible program and an incredible group of people. Mm -hmm. What has been your what what would you say is your experience with with young athletes that have got a, a set, let's say lesser beginner's mindset or a, a perhaps a little bit of a tussle with that idea and anything that you have found that guides them through that process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a that's a really good question. And first, yeah, I'm so grateful for Caroline for introducing us. What she and Rebecca have done, you know, I. I looked up to them as when I was a youth athlete. So it, it is this reciprocal, like cyclical mentor, mentee, supportive relationship. And I love that. And as much as I work with these athletes, they teach me so much about myself and that's the power of rise. And at rise, we work with youth athletes and teen athletes to develop their mental wellness and their mindset power. And, um, the biggest thing is showing them that like their emotions are their super strength and like they can do these things. And we need people to tell us and remind us of that. And sadly, in the world that we exist in, we don't we don't have enough of belief in ourselves and we don't have enough people showing us and guiding us. And um, 
that is so powerful. Um, but to answer your question in terms of how, what I see and people's uh, maybe a little bit of their hesitation or reservation towards being a beginner at something, it, I'll speak from my experiences in like my adult life. It's, it sucks to be new and the worst at something, especially when you grew up as an athlete that excelled in their sport. I get it. It is scary. And I've learned to reframe that and see that, that nervousness and that, that energy around doing something for the first time as like exhilarating, as life-giving, like it is childlike to be able to go play outside and do that for the first time and realize like no one's judging me. I have nothing to lose here. Like no one cares if I have to walk my bike up the trail except myself. And I think that's the hardest thing that I see in a lot of these athletes. We're hard on ourselves, Hmm. especially as competitive athletes. We put very high pressure on what we think we need to do that it doesn't always come from our coaches. It comes from what we know that what we're capable of. And we want to see that to fruition. And that's the biggest thing that I work with these athletes on is working through that pressure and not against that, seeing it, that that is their care. When we, when we feel an emotion such as pressure or nervousness, it it comes from a place of it mattering to us. And like when we recognize that and we can tap into that, we can use it to our advantage. And so that's the biggest thing I really see. And I think that parallel between being a beginner is like encouraging them to lean into that. And so it's by like asking thought provoking questions, just like really like what does that feel like in our body to to be given a set and not be sure if you can complete it for the first time. But that's where confidence comes from. That's where like understanding ourselves is like we can step up in that moment. Then we know of ourselves as like the, being that person that can do that. So when we come up against a challenge, I know myself as Amanda, I'm the one that can do that. And when we write that narrative and write that message, that is so powerful. And so I try to like show them that every day when we're talking, like talking about their practices that week, talking about a challenge that they had, it's like, you do recognize you overcame that. And that started here. It didn't start, you know, here in our body, it started in our heart and our mind. And like, when they see that they are so much more than their physical ability, then that carries over to life too. And that's why I love being a beginner and stuff, because if I could conquer that thing and like take that rock garden on the trails and mountain biking and I did it and I, it it was so hard for me. I can do that in life too. Yeah. I can do the things that make me nervous. And that's so powerful. We all need to feel that strength and that comes from ourselves and that's showing us that we can. Yeah. That, I often say that with that whole beginner's mindset and and even just going into something new, we feel that anxiety or lack of confidence because we don't have much under control. We don't have mm-hmm. as much control as we wish we'd hoped. And there's always this, there's the the blend of the illusion of control and the demon of expectation, mm-hmm. which is oh I am I, I am not in control of this moment but my expectation is that I should be or that I should be achieving some high level of expertise in this when actually the definition of anxiety really is just trying to control things you can't control. Mm-hmm. So go into, I, I said to a young young lad that I was working with last night and say, look, you can't control the outcome of this right now because we're not working on an outcome-based thing. We, we're trying to work on can you put in as much effort into getting better at this? Can you focus on your breath right now? All of these things. Let's grab as many handles as we can that you can control. And then suddenly that anxiety drops, confidence increases, and the experience becomes way more. And I go, okay, I can get through this. The byproduct is I got better. I got, I learned, and I actually mm-hmm. achieved something at the end of it. And so that's kind of my way of, of, of tussling through that experience. That is such a powerful exercise to be able to identify, like, where can we attach this feeling of lack of control or expectation? Like, where is that coming from? And then how do we shift that to recognizing like where we do have control or releasing that too? Like just recognizing it is sometimes enough, like practicing visualization. So a lot of times when athletes are stepping up to the block and how I felt this my entire, like, my entire childhood, I had so much performance anxiety around going up because I cared so much and I practiced so hard and did so well that I would be like, oh, I have to do well. And, and I would get up to the block and just freeze and be like, 
I would be able to hit these best times in practice, but when it came to a meet, I could never perform. And it was because I got in my own way. But when we work with visualization and we practice, we've already gone up to the block a hundred times and visualize, visualize that and have been there. It's not as like, it's not as scary. And we can, we can practice calming our nervous system down and getting control of our breath. And like, like those sort of like self-manipulation and exercise and working with our brain, like we all face that. I still face that. I have a really good story about a race recently that was insane um, where I had to, I really do the same thing that I like work with these other athletes with. Cause we still have to practice that. Lewis, I'm sure yeah. you have that. If you're like having a conversation with someone that maybe like nerve wracking too, I, I get that way. Even before a podcast, I have to like take a deep breath, calm myself down and like settle into my body. So that way we can be more present and respond in the way that's more truthful to us. Yeah, no, I mean, I've always said to people, it's really interesting teaching mindfulness, teaching whether it's uh, breathing exercises, breath work or yoga. If I'm teaching these mindful practices to people, uh, I have to always remind them that the reason I'm teaching them is because I've taken an interest in them because Mm -hmm. I needed them. I've seen the benefit from them. And not only that, it's not like my work is done. It's not like Mm -hmm. I I actually found a really interesting part of my own thought process on this the other day, which was I found myself getting caught up in the expectation to be at a certain level of expertise within these Mm -hmm. realms. So I've delved into now performance psychology and it was actually in a moment of my my a uni uh, an assignment that we were doing for this for this degree module and one of the people that was on the course had got their assignment back and it was it was on a whatsapp group chat and and they like oh, i didn't get the mark that i'd hoped for and i and i sat there and thought i, I understand that you you've put effort into it mm-hmm. and you're now frustrated at the the result but they were measuring their ability mm-hmm. of what level they would got they had got through against the 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 guys who were teaching it, the the tutors and the mm. lecturers, and I thought these guys have had twenty five years head start on on an ex, on on this realm of knowledge and expertise in an area, and you feel like you're not at that level. Your skill set might be in how you deliver it. You you are also delving into the next part of that learning experience, which is going out, grabbing the piece of paper, saying you've got the degree, and then actually learning on the job. And I found myself thinking, well. If I'm teaching mindfulness, I think Sam Harris said this really well once. Uh, do you follow Sam Harris? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I heard Sam Harris say that he obviously teaches mindfulness and meditation, and he's also a neurobiologist. And he said, I'm I'm not the best neurobiologist in the world, and neither am I the best mindfulness and meditation expert in the world. But he's like, combine those two together, and I'm very good at bringing those two together. Mm-hmm. And I thought that is literally the thing that i need to hold on to all the time is that i i was never the best athlete i was never the the greatest athlete to have ever lived neither am i the finest meditation mindfulness breathing exercise coach on the planet because there are people out there that have been doing it a lot longer but i bring those two together and that's what creates my power so it's i think when when you I don't know where we kind of got off on that tangent, but for me, it's it's bringing it back to again, recognizing what you are con- controlling and and ultimately what you're bringing to the table in that moment mm-hmm. and finding the power from that. Yeah, I don't know where we uh, went off on that tangent. Well, so like- actually, I want to go with where you were heading because we we got one of the brilliant things about my mind is like I can like kind of trace back, but I kind of liked where we were taking that conversation. So in speaking to you know your peer who is feeling like they weren't meeting the grade that they need to get. A lot of us feel that way in so many different things. And we can feel like an imposter. I'm writing a book. I have no place to be writing Mm -hmm. a book. Like, you know, I'm not a professional. I didn't get some degree that said you get to write a book, but I have enough care and willingness to do it. And that's all that matters sometimes. And throughout every part of that process, you know, talking about being a beginner, I've come up against the challenge of, is this good enough? Like, do I even have a place to be saying this? I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a neuroscientist. I'm not all those things. But what I am is I have a very broad perspective across the food system, across athletics with mindset coaching. And, and they're very deep experiences that I can bring a lot to the table. And 
I recently learned of a term called a multi-potentialite. Have you heard of it? No, that sounds interesting. Okay. Tell me. Yes. Okay. So it was, I think the podcast or it was a TED talk that came out, I think it was like 2013. It's a while ago, but Emily Wapnick, she coined this term and it's, you can, you know, people like the Renaissance person or a multi-passionate person, but it's talking about someone who embodies a bunch of different identities and performs a variety of tasks, but like very gracefully. And they do all these things. And um, because they do all these various activities, they're able to synthesize connections, be, be more adaptable, see the big picture, have more greater empathy for people because they have all these broad experiences they're pulling from. But what also can happen is you can feel like an imposter because you're not an expert at blank. Now I've mm. spent my whole life hating the question that people say, what do you do? And I hate that question because I do so many different things. And I feel when I speak oh. that to someone who doesn't understand, it makes me feel like I'm not actually good at anything because I do all these little things. And when reality, that's not the case. But what the problem is, like, where did we learn to assign the meaning of wrong or abnormal to doing many things? And you, like how you're able to work with mindset and your athleticism and business and do all these things. Like that's a beautiful gift that makes you unique. But for some reason, our society has said that's it's you need to do one thing and you need to do it well. And, um, you know, I had a lot of shame with that for a long time. And recently I've just learned to like step into that and think I actually like I'm kind of like a life triathlete. Like I do all these sports, but I do a lot of like different things too. And I think they actually multi, like they, they support each other. Like by mm -hmm. doing all these things, they make me better at the other thing. Like, just like yeah. you were saying with your own experience. Yeah. I, I resonate with that really strongly. <laughs> and I, I funny enough had said this recently that I had only, so I retired from cricket in 2000 and, 16 mm -hmm. and it's now nearly six years on from that and i have only really felt confident in the last few months let's say just at the back end of last year introducing myself differently i used to introduce myself as hi i'm lewis former professional creator and then i do this this and this and i have always been whether it's openly talking about this, the the identity crisis that you go through, especially post career, and it just crystallized that yeah, we get wrapped up in what society hopes for us to essentially bring to the table. Like you need this label of what you do, and again, that's for me the wrong metric that we're measuring it by with this stamp of identity card or whatever it might look like. What impact can you have on people is really what I like to think. It's like, mm -hmm. what's the impact? When you are leaving a person, what can how can you make them feel? Mm -hmm. And I I had an experience, and and it's based off that. this idea of hierarchy, this hierarchy of not whether it's knowledge or experience and and what, what your background, where you've come from, might be culture, whatever it might be. I remember having an an experience. When I was when I was a pro, it was probably the first couple of years, and I was in South Africa, and I was playing in over there, and we were training. We were at this training camp, and when we turned up to training camp, an international South African player was actually already at the training camp, and he was doing his own private session, so he was playing for his nation, but he happened to be fr he wasn't on sort of on duty, but he was training with a friend, and the guy who was basically feeding the ball machine for him was just a friend that he'd asked. And this guy was not a coach. You could tell very quickly that this guy was not a coach. He was merely just a, a mm. hand for him to, to assist putting the ball in the machine. And then after the session, as he was like clearing up the balls, he asked this guy what he saw. He asked him like, what did you see? Tell me what you saw. And he was asking him for feedback. And I kind of stopped. And in my straight away, my mind was like, who are you to ask this guy? what what he's given he's not a coach like why are you asking his opinion and he just literally was like no i was trying to do this 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 did you see that did you see and this guy was like energized from him just simply asking this question and being like yeah i actually saw you do this and he goes oh great i'm going to change that and that's the thing that i was working on okay i wasn't doing it then and he goes can we do another round can can you look at it there and i thought he just stripped his ego out of it in that moment mm -hmm. and just asked this 
what you would class in inverted commas everyday guy a professional like a genuine professional athlete asking just the everyday what did you see what did you what did you get from what you were seeing i trust your eyes i trust what you're seeing tell me and i just thought that's something that for me is sometimes missing like we feel there has to be this hierarchical um structure to who we are whether it's we get advice from what they think of us what they expect of us and really like is in the moment are you just getting better at what you're doing are you just improving the thing that you are trying to improve on controlling what you can control and it doesn't really matter what who's watching or who's giving that advice Mm -mm. so uh, like so many different thoughts on that you know your story reminded me of ted lasso and the guy who was like the manager like the ball guy and then ted like makes him a coach (laughs) but without spoiling it you know yeah but it was like he was really good at it because he had a different perspective of looking at the field and i think actually coming into things with like a fresh eyes and fresh perspective is very valuable and, and like industries outside of sport too, like you think about people that are like embedded in a certain culture or doing one thing, they look at it a certain way than someone who experiences the world through another lens looks at it. And that's so powerful for innovation and change and how to like take performance to the next level. And, and that can be like on the field or I think of about my career too, how I come at something with a different perspective. I'm not just like doing the same thing everyone else has been doing that doesn't work for years. And like, mm. if we are open-minded enough to, and, and, and humble enough to, to recognize that one, I might not know everything. And two, um, you know, I might not be an expert, but I can look at it this way. I think that is also very powerful. And I always look at sport and like the experience that you had, it's like the lessons we learn from sport can carry over to life. And and that's what it's about. And you always talk about like being a human before an athlete. And, and I'm just like a huge proponent of that. Um, mm. I, I don't want people to look at me and only see me for my sport and like for my identity, just as like you had trouble letting go and like, like say, like being comfortable identifying or introducing yourself as someone else. It's because like when we say, Hey, I'm a professional cricket player. It's like, there's, there's like credibility behind that. Like people are like, okay, like he's legit. Yep. Mm. Yeah. And it's like, we're comfortable with that persona, but like, are we comfortable with, like you said, just being a person who has an impact or being a good person? Like for some reason that's, it, it isn't valued the same. I think we, I think that there's probably a a side note that needs to be made with this is that (laughs) we're not saying going out and getting advice from everyone on the street about things, because when you are (laughs) striving for excellence, it does matter Mm -hmm. the, the people that you listen to at some that you do want to know that the person that you've had has an experience in some way so Mm -hmm. it's really tough to to find that i don't know if it is tough to find that blend of of credibility with with humanistic traits essentially i can think of it like you think about it like having a diverse team like think about like having a sports psychologist and a nutritionist and a coach and a strength trainer you're not going to go to the nutritionist and ask for your strength workout yeah. But all those people combined blended together support you. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you said you kind of touched on it even in the sw- swimming culture and you're not the only person that has mm-hmm. spoken. I think there was actually some things that came out in the UK about some swimming clubs and and things like that, but they it has been documented that swimming cultures are pretty rough, they're pretty tough. Um it, it's especially on women as well. I think women Mm -hmm. definitely feel that side of that a a little bit harsher. And I'm I'm sure that you've had many coaches in there that are credible coaches, but Mm -hmm. really lacked the human traits behind it. So this, like everything, is a spectrum. Like it's literally a spectrum of of what you're going to find. Yeah, I mean, I could dive into those experiences, probably a lot that people resonate with. I'll start with saying I've had, I did have incredible coaches that, like are still great friends of mine and mentors and people I talk to today. And I also had coaches that give me empathy and understanding for what so many women face in sport, unfortunately, Um, from like being eight years old and having like the fat picked off of my skin. And I'm very fortunate that I was in a smaller body as a little kid, but that doesn't mean anything. So I was around like, this is why there's burnout and like people don't stick with sports is because there was abuse. There was emotional abuse, other forms of abuse. There is like being told you need to look and look a certain way to be an athlete. 
that's like why I'm like such a big proponent on like not looking at weight as an indicator of our performance. Like there are like a hundred other things you can do before you look a certain way. Um, but for some reason, especially as women in swimsuits, that is the first thing that a coach sees. Um, and because I was in a smaller body, they think I'm healthy but I was burnt out. I was exhausted. I was chronically injured and overworked and not getting enough sleep and stressed and my mood changed. But like, because I looked a certain way, like there was no problem with me, but we, I had coaches tell me like to eat a carrot before a meat <clears throat> instead of like a cliff bar, or I wasn't taken out to eat because they're like, you, you had enough food today. So like, Yes, we see a lot, like there have been so many great coaches that have been truly pivotal to like my outlook and what I've learned through life. And I've also had a lot of coaches that, you know, kind of perpetuate the stigma of burnout and sport and abuse and a reason why, unfortunately, a lot of women don't continue in sports past age 14, which is, a, that is like the, typically the drop off for a lot of women in sports. And it's one of the reasons I do what I do at rise is because like, I wish I had someone. The only reason I kept going was because I knew I wanted to swim in college, but I was swimming by myself. Like I didn't even really have teammates after a while because everyone left. Cause it was so bad. But I was like, I want, I know I need to do this. I know I need to put up with this. I don't really have a choice. Um, I, I wish I had a mentor so bad that like I could have talked to that would have understood my situation and that would remind me of what matters in sport too. And that like, I'm so much more beside that. I mean, that's like the biggest thing to, sometimes is like having someone hold space for you. And that's what we do like with working with teen athletes. Like, can you imagine how much better this world would be if someone just had 30 minutes to talk about their feelings and chat? Um, yeah. I think I, a lot of what we're going through would be helped. Yeah, I've I've really started sort of bringing them the mantra of be the person that you wish you had when you were younger like that's yeah. it's not my own man that's definitely been said before and it's mm -hmm. a quote that i found but it's something that <laughs> just really has resonated with me recently it's something mm -hmm. that i just keep trying to with the work that i'm doing is like try and be that voice that change yes. the the person that you wish you saw in the world i think if we can all do that G gandhi said that, that I think. Yeah, yeah that's it yes it is gandhi <laughs> <laughs> of course it is um and <laughs> Nine I, times out of ten, you can just say that. <laughs> you, yeah, nine times out of ten, you just quote Gandhi. And um, and I, I I definitely have started to feel that more recently. That's for sure. It's 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 um yeah, quite profound actually. That I'm gonna take a little bit of a left turn. Okay. I'm all about taking a turn. To, yeah, just really <laughs> grab the wheel and turn left. Uh, is, I want because we kind of touched on food there slightly, but mm -hmm. your exploration with food, like where has that come from and we can talk about the, the cookbook and 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 the yeah. recipe or the non the non-recipe book it's a gr <laughs> such yes. a cool name such a cool oh, name but it. um where's where's all that sort of come from and it, the interest in that come from so it it started super early on in my life so i'm the oldest of three brothers um the only girl i had a big family growing up and both my parents worked we were all involved in sports really busy as kids and it started because like from first grade, my parents were like, if you want food, you need to make it yourself. Like we don't have time to cook for you. You're very hungry. Like my parents always joke about, I was, I was five and my parents were watching a show that I didn't want to watch on TV. And I literally packed a hamburger, took my brothers in a wagon and was like, and left. But like, I thought to bring food for everyone, you know, as like a <laughs> kindergartner, like I always have thought about, okay, but I need to fuel myself for this. So from a very young age, like I would have like three peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I'd pack like carrots and grapes and apples. And I would just feed myself like, and make something with whatever was in the house. And as I started to get older, so like from a very young age, I believe there is so much power in taking ownership of our health from a young age. Like if we, I studied like health science and behavior and you know, public health. And if you want to change someone's behavior, it needs to start young. And so I think I'm like pretty much a testament of that. My dad, like my first, my first birthday cake was like this, like an edible carrot cake. My parents made that like, was like vegan and like tasted horrible, but they kind of, my dad always instilled in me like pretty, like good eating habits. And as I got older, I began to attach and recognize how what I put into my body changed the way I felt and performed. And so it was very much this like bodily experience of recognizing when I ate and ate enough and ate, you know, vegetables, I felt better and I was faster too. And that's all I cared about. 
I just wanted to be faster. And mm-hmm. so people kind of caught on to that. Like when I was in middle school, I had friends that would be like, can you like tell me what to eat and like write a journal for me? And, and I like knew nothing. I would like kind of like buy some books on like how you to eat as an athlete. But I would just like self, like self teach myself these things. But in doing that, I like developed a relationship with my body of like respect and recognizing I needed to nourish it in order to perform. And unfortunately, that is a message not many people get. And I'm not just even going to box in women to this because eating disorders are incredibly prominent in men. But we look at like we need less of something in order to get stronger or better. And instead, typically we need to add more to Mm. to what we're eating. And we need to develop a very loving relationship with it, one that is is nourishing to us, is compassionate and like seeing food and fuel as something that is giving to us and not taking from us. And so like from a very early age, like I developed that relationship with it. And I'm so grateful for that. Um, I went on to study it in college. I studied nutrition and exercise science and um, ended up like starting a food truck where I got local food delivered and gave students an opportunity and an outlet to like apply their own entrepreneurial ideas and designing the truck and creating the menu. And I don't wanted to support the local community. And I started like getting in a a very much more broader perspective of food and recognizing like the system at play in the farmers and how it's getting to someone's plate, um, how it can be used to like develop um, connection and culture or how it can be used to develop skill sets for people that are just getting into the food system. And anyways, um, there's a lot to that, but I have always loved cooking for myself. And so people would always be like, how'd you make that? Like, what is that? And I'd be like, I don't know. Like I just, I just threw it together. Like I just walked into my kitchen and like puzzled this magical meal together. That was delicious. And it started a couple of years ago when people were like, can you like write a recipe book? And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So um, I got this whiteboard and every night when I started cooking, I would like write down like what I was doing because there was like no other way for me to capture it. Cause I usually just like did it by habit and would like put together a meal and I didn't follow a recipe. And like very shortly, I realized I am the last person to be writing a recipe book when I've literally never followed a recipe in my entire life, (laughs) nor have I followed a recipe in the way I live my life either. And I found all these beautiful parallels between the lessons and the power of the kitchen and how that carries over to the way we live, the way we move, the way we exist in the world and relate to others. And so the book became so much more than just like me writing down what I now call my non-recipes. Cause they're, they're very fluid. Um, they're not very calculated or methodological. They're invitations to check in with yourself, um, find things that work with you, you know, with food and access to food. I recognize like we all need different things to fuel our day to day. We might be working with a can, a 99 cent can of green beans, or we might be working with something fresh from the farmer's market. Ultimately it's working with what you have. And that is so important for life. We need to do the best with what we have in this moment. And if we can learn to do that in the kitchen, that carries over to the way we live too. So I love to turn to food as a way to connect to myself and the world around me. And honestly, just like a grounding force of of nourishment from like a whole self nourishment, not just like the calories in my body, but my mood. And and I look at food as like so much more than just like calories now. It is like this like beautiful, beautiful thing. So how would you describe being compassionate for your food? Like how, what, what does mm. that look like for you? Oh, I, that is such a beautiful question. So I think I'll start with saying in, in athletics, it is so ingrained in us to be tough, to be mentally mm. tough, to be resilient. It's just like macho mentality and mm, we're tough. We can't and like, how dare you be soft or kind to yourself because that that's lesser than, except what I've learned. And there's a lot of studies that point to this too, is like, we can be as compassionate to ourselves as we are tough. And like, that's underpinned in mindfulness. And so like, there are like recent studies in like 2019, there was a study in Canada called the zipper effect. And they studied that, like these women that were like rated with self-compassion and mental toughness, basically they performed better than those that were just mentally tough. Um, and the NCAA, NCAA has done some studies on this in terms of like mindfulness and trying to support athlete mental health. But when it comes to feeding and being compassionate towards how we feed ourselves, I think that starts with developing empathy for ourselves and checking in with our body and what we need. And so a lot of times when it comes to food, we think of it, especially as athletes, that we have to, we have to earn it. 
I don't get that food unless I had a hard workout, um, unless I burn enough calories. And instead, if we looked at how it's nourishing us and like allowing us to um, be our fullest in the world, allowing us to use our brain to the fullest. And, and it's not just about like performance and sport. It's about showing up as our full self. Um, we can see the act of cooking as something that gives and, and allows us to listen to our body and like indulge in this act of nourishing ourselves. Like it can be this indulgent thing. And here, you're going to love this. I recently, I found or learned about this study on the Huberman podcast where our mindset around eating I was literally about to say oh, this you just study. Heard. I was yes. literally about this was on my head going you need to you're <laughs> either going to talk about Dr. Aaliyah Crum or you're going to yes. mention this study but I'm going to allow you to continue okay. this train of thought because people need to listen to this study it is so powerful so I'm so glad you know that um so this study for her um well one they found that like how we looked about food literally changed the way we digested it and re responded to the food. So they gave two, they had like a subject group and they gave them, they told them they were giving them different caloric milkshakes. So they told them like one was super heavy in calories and like, was this indulgent treat? And then they told them that one was like more of like a diet milkshake and didn't have that many calories and their body digested the, the two milkshakes differently, even though they were exactly the same. The one that they actually digested better or like more efficiently was the higher caloric milkshake. And the reason they think is because our body perceived that as indulgent, as this treat, as this like, ooh, like this is so good and yummy and like how nice that we get this. Whereas the other one was kind of seen as like limiting and less than and how we can apply that to our eating. It doesn't mean you need to have like this high calorie milkshake all the time. But what if we did look at our food as something that was a treat? So like I picked that the lettuce, the lettuce out of the ground, something that I tended and grew and cared for. And I was like, wow, this is like such a beautiful gift that I'm giving myself. Or like we go to the farmer that we buy the food from and we're like, thank you. Like this is like so fresh and satisfying or even just like recognizing the creative act of what we built in that moment and just like being mindful and eating it and recognizing how beautiful and grateful we are for this. That changes the way our body digests the food. And no, not enough people talk about that. Like we yeah. we talk about like the calories, the macros, the diets. What if we change and it was our mindset around food and how we related to it? That is powerful. I'm was, so was glad that you know that study. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it was such a fascinating. And I actually have reached out to... Um, Dr. Leah Crum, and unfortunately, which she's probably going to have to wait a little while for her to come on because she is uh, incredibly oh, busy. But I'm jealous. She, I want to. I can't wait for that podcast. I mean, yeah, she came back, but it's it'd probably take a while. But um, <laughs> that 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 whole that podcast really got me thinking because they measured that study through ghrelins, which is a marker in the stomach mm -hmm. that just triggers satisfaction, mm -hmm. and essentially, like, am I satisfied from this meal? Like, I said, or content with this meal? And, the, and the, like you said, the milkshake was just simply a 300 calorie milkshake for both people, yeah. but one was being told it was higher. The funny thing is, is, is we, I have this, I had this thing when I was being an athlete that I would, I love dark chocolate. Dark chocolate is my <laughs> thing. And, and I really love really dense dark, dark chocolate. Like, so 80 to 85, it's mm -hmm. just the thing that I like. And yeah, very fortunate. It's actually good for you in a way. So yeah, that's, right? that's <laughs> But it, but I would I would actually say to my coaches like oh, if I'm having some like I don't eat like a 500 gram bar I I'm eating like literally a few squares and I'm because I'm having it for the the rich indulgent feeling that I'm getting from it because there is a mark there is a, mm -hmm. a moment where we have too much of a good thing mm -hmm. and we overstep that mark and then I'm sure everyone has felt this where they. Christmas time is the best example where we just go nuts and then we feel dreadful after. Mm -hmm. And it's like there's this crossing of a border where we, we go, okay, I'm indulgent and I feel indulgent, but then I overindulge and I'm willing to just go and, and, and gorge myself on it. So there's always this hard blend that you need to, to have. And, and yeah, I think our outlook on how, whether we train a training can, you can put training into that same, yeah. same element. They did the same study in that, in that same podcast. They, well, they did a, a different study the with janitors. the cleaners. Yeah. The cleaners yes. of the hotel rooms. And they mm -hmm. would basically oh, yeah. to, to describe it, they took a, a group of 
well, a hotel staff that who were cleaning mm-hmm. the rooms. And they questionnaired them on whether they thought they were getting sufficient enough exercise throughout the, the week, in it, throughout the day. Bear in mind, they are cleaners who are going up and down stairs. They're stripping beds. Carrying 50 cleaning. pounds they're, of, yeah. Oh, they're just shifting masses of stuff throughout the day. And I think it was something like, seven, I'm going to misquote the figures here, but it might be 70% or it might be 30% thought they, it was a third actually. It was a third of them thought they weren't getting enough exercise. And they were like, well, here's what you're doing. And then by simply showing them and changing their mindset on what a workout actually looks like, it changed their, I think think they were losing weight and things like that. So it was simply, it's such a power. It it speaks to the power of what it can look like to change health behaviors by empowering someone to recognize what they're doing right. And, And that simply changes our perception of, of our relationship to it. So like by simply telling the, that staff, that you are getting enough exercise, you're doing all these great things and motivated them. And it like, it, it reframed how they looked at themselves. Hmm. And that's so powerful to change, like to recognize. And like, they saw themselves as someone that was fit simply because they were provided that information. Hmm. Uh, I love that study. And I, I love how she touched on two different things in like the realm of like health behaviors and also like nutrition and diet. And like, to your point on um like overindulgence, Like so often that happens because we restrict too. And especially as athletes, when you're like, oh, I can't eat a bad food. I'm training. I can't do these things. If we allowed ourselves some, we wouldn't feel the desire to overindulge because of lack. If we had a mindset of abundance and recognizing that we always have this, chips are always in the pantry. We always have that chocolate in the fridge if we want it. Then we don't feel the need to eat, 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 eat it when it's available to us. Like if we just allowed ourselves to have it and that's sort of the, like there's certain steps and like creating a non-recipe. And I talk about like tuning into yourself and recognizing your needs and like connecting with what you have in that moment. Because if we actually like took the second to listen to ourselves, like we have the answers on what we need to eat. It's the Mm -hmm. fact that there's so much noise around us from marketing and propaganda in the food industry saying you need this. Oh, this is the diet. If this is the way you need to look. And it's like, if we, put our blinders up and just listen to ourselves first. Like we can hold those answers. And, mm. and I think that's like what, even though I, I have understanding of all this nutrition knowledge and diets and yada, 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 I'm like, kind of like say, ignore that. Like, let's set that aside for a second. We're overcomplicating this. Like really this just comes down to like doing the best with what you have and feeding and like nourishing yourself in this moment. Like let's not complicate it. Like, let's just look at our food as this indulgent, like beautiful gift that we can have. And like, it can be as simple as that. Um, we, especially, you know, in sports, we're like, we need to have this many calories and do this much. Like we'll eventually get that if we just listen to ourselves. Um, but we don't trust ourselves enough to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you'd spoken about how I, I love all of that. And I, you touched on how young people don't have that awareness. Uh, I've got a former guest actually Mark Pugh he works with footballers and young athletes on educating them on how to like cook oh, wait, just is that the foodie awareness. football yeah yeah foodie. Footballer. I listened to that podcast yeah so he he actually did something this week at, or the week just gone with a prof- the f- former professional team that he used to play for he went into the academy and he was educating them on like how to cook a good nutritious meal at the end of a game and he was doing it in the kitchen at the club and and it And obviously this is a professional football club, Mm -hmm. but these kids are not getting the, the sort of resource that all of the Mm -hmm. full pros are getting. They're going home and they're kind of like having to fend for themselves. Sometimes they're in, uh, they're they're in other people's homes because they're housed in other people's homes because they've come from different areas of the country. So they have to have a good understanding of how to -hmm. to fuel themselves. And and it's, that's a challenge when you are an athlete that just sees like, can calories in calories out mm-hmm. and i'm a machine but yeah. there is a much deeper that's where food nutrition just plays such mm-hmm. a deeper role i think f- for all of the press that he's been getting recently novak Djokovic is actually someone to really who, who oh, i wow. have read a lot about about his his nutrition and how he delves into like what it's actually bringing to him he doesn't i mean he was recently in the the news for his his vaccine tri- uh, his vaccine issues mm. of going into Australia. But he said something in an interview that he did with the BBC. He's like, I, mo- I monitor everything that goes in my body. 
So I'm monitoring it. And it, it sounded like clinical, but mm. I've seen him on some very holistic programs where he's talking about the actual impact of that nutrition on what it means for his well-being, his his movement, mm. his his cognition and everything. And it's, yeah, there might be a calorie in, calorie out element to it, but... Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what are if you're speaking in terms and we're really turning on the performance dial here, which mm -hmm. is what's it actually doing for you in every asset of your sport? Yeah. Every asset mm -hmm. is it your recovery, your thinking, your your emotional stability? Like, what's it bringing to the table for you? Well, and food is medicine, right? And like, if we leaned on that into like the natural forms of serving our body, whether that is like anti-inflammatory properties, um, protein synthesis, you know, glycogen, like there, mm. it has all, there's all of these, yes, you can get into the nitty gritty of that, you know, uh, we can make it more simple, but like if people love it, like I, so I do like to nerd out on that sort of stuff. I recognize <laughs> sometimes that can be debilitating for people to understand and connect to food. So sometimes I don't always go into that, but I also love to study that because it is so fascinating. I wouldn't, I remember like being in class and it was like totally a osmosis Jones, if you've ever seen that movie, but like, I'm like visualizing like the cells oh in my, my God, body, that shot, like, that film. like, grow, <laughs> like they're like, they're growing and they're getting yes. like, they're developing and the protein serving them. Like I would literally imagine like things going to my body and utilizing it. Cause like, the, I'm like, that's so beautiful that if you want to like kind of look at us like art, like a car, an engine, you know, yes, it's like we are utilizing these these carbohydrate, you know, chains and like turning it into like literally my thoughts and ideas and getting me across the pool. Like that is so cool. I yeah. I mean, I really like that sort of stuff too. Um, and so I certainly look at food as like. I, I do understand the clinical aspects and the importance and the science behind it. And I also have a unique perspective of like looking at it from like the community elements, the soulful elements, mm -hmm. and like so many different dimensions of understanding how food, you know, is a part of our world. Like we all got to eat. Right. So like mm -hmm. we can all relate to food at some point and we can use it to relate to each other too. Um, yeah. Food's powerful. So I have a lot of like, my book is really long. Um, I'm editing it down right now because I obviously have so much to say on this. And um, I, so I'm in the editing phase of it at the moment and, and, you know, talking about just like being a beginner at something and it's really tough. Like I have a ton of imposter syndrome at times. I, yeah. um, I, it's, it's, you know, editing is difficult. Um, cutting back your words is hard. Uh, focusing on it, you know, all of these mm -hmm. things are bring a challenge, but I'm kind of like, I talk about leaning into that discomfort of doing it and, I love learning about myself through that process of, of learning and writing about it. Yeah, I, I, I will leave show note. I will leave notes in the uh, links in the show notes for that. Any Anyone oh, cool. to reach out about the book and then for yeah. anything that comes up in the future, we'll, we'll bring them in as well. I love that. Um, let's, let's jump into the topic of ADHD, mm -hmm. which is something we, sp we spoke about just before we started the podcast. I haven't spoken about it on the show of... of, of or even has spoken to anyone who had been diagnosed with it. So you said you were diagnosed at the age of four. Was that? Was yeah, that I was right? really young. Yeah, my, right, mostly so talk us because, through that experience. Well, so yeah, oh my whole life. Um, here's my life story. So <laughs> I mean, I very early on, my parents were like, "Whoa, this girl has a lot of energy." You know, the kind where like I didn't sleep at night. School was really tough uh, for me. Like sitting in my desk was really tough for me. I loved learning. I loved engaging. Um, there's some like really sad stories about like how my actions were not perceived as how I intended them to be as a kid, but I can go into that later. Um, and so, yeah, so from a very early age, my parents used medication as a form of like helping me. Like they were like, she's going to have trouble in school if she's not medicated or she's going to have trouble like making friends and like existing in this world because she's very different. Um, and that my dad grew up with ADHD too. Then he like the whole like medication of it kind of happened in like the 90s, 70s and 90s. So like it's very during his lifetime, like they didn't medicate him for it. And he kind of saw the effects of that like school, like took it took him like I think nine years to go through college, like things that like he felt like his ADHD kind of held him back. So he didn't want that to be the case for me. Um, but he was always that person that understood me, that knew that like I just like had a lot of energy and I cared a lot. And so, um, he believed in me and it was really nice to have 
him see me as I saw myself. But um, what was really hard growing up with that was just how um, it, it felt like everything that, and I'm like still working through a lot of the like kind of wounds from this, but so much of how I existed in the world, when people knew I had ADHD, they'd be like, oh, that energy, that's because she has ADHD. So like they would attribute like these negative aspects of myself to this disease. And that's what it felt like. It felt like I grew up with Mm. this disease that needed to be remedied with medication. Like I wasn't allowed to exist fully as myself in the world because the world like couldn't handle that. Like I was too much for this world. And like that being your narrative and story is incredibly unhealthy. Instead of being told like, Amanda, you have a gift. Like your brain can hold so much information and you have this endless energy and that can be used for all these things. Instead, it was like, you raise your hand too much in class. You have too much energy at practice. You should be tired. You, um, you talk too much. You have too many ideas. Like the things that now make me incredibly like awesome entrepreneur, ultra endurance athlete, like, you know, friend partner, like those were things that were really shamed when I grew up. And I'm so glad I never lost those elements of myself, but I'll, I'll never forget being kicked out of class. Cause I raised my hand too much. Like I remember I was just telling the story, like why it's top of mind. That's when I partnered this the other day. I had a teacher in sixth grade, kick me out of class for raising my hand and saying I was disruptive. And it was because no one else was participating. So I, I was like, Oh, I I'll help. And she thought I was like being like mocking or something and like threw me out in the hallway or like all these places where this, our, our systems and our, especially our education system, like wasn't built for people that were neurodiverse that made it really hard for me. And sports was that one place that like, I felt welcome that I felt appreciated for what Mm -hmm. I held because like what it made me a great leader. It, it, I had energy at practice. It was an outlet for me. And so like, I, I often say like swimming saved my life because if I didn't have that, I think my self image would be very different. How I would look at the world, um, how I would look at myself, it would be completely changed if I didn't have swimming to see that like I could use those for good. Um, but it was really, it was really hard. And, um, I stayed medicated until I was through college. Um, and after that I stopped cold Turkey. I was like, I don't want this. Like, I feel like I am like half assing myself. Like I'm literally like numbing part of who I am to fit the mold. And like, I don't need this to focus. Like I can find other ways to have focus. And I've changed the way that I look at focus and like it kind of going into like the, um, you know, focusing on one thing and being this one person, like for so long, like I thought I had to do this one thing. And when I realized I can be multi-potential it, I can have all these different things. It was, it was like the medication for my ADHD. It was like, this is my strength. I can Mm -hmm. give this much energy into this project and also do this thing and be really good at that and then be an athlete. And I can do all these things and be all these things. And if I think if I was medicated, I wouldn't recognize that. I wouldn't recognize that that is my strength. And um, I used to see that as that was so bad. Um, it's like it's, I'm scattered, you know? It, it just, it's so, so empowering that to hear that almost the, the definitive moment of giving up the medication is like you embracing the 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 best part of you and if i'm really yeah. honest like i i'm a i'm a big believer in athletes I, I there's two things like one i love that sport became that out that outlet mm-hmm. that society weirdly doesn't allow us to accept high energy people mm-hmm. in that way i don't know it's why disruptive that is. it's like yeah. too hard like when you have 30 people in class it's like they're just trying to get you in your line and behave and just do what yeah. you're told and sit down so anyone yeah. that breaks that norm it's it throws the system off. It's hard, you know? And I mean, I had tons of friends. Like, it's not like it like kept me from having friendships. Like my friends really appreciated who I was, but like the school system didn't like that. Um, And in sport, it's lauded. Like in sport, then it's, Mm -hmm. it's, it's absolutely adored. Like if you've got high energy, it's like you're you're in a position of leadership because you have got enough energy to get us through. To like rally everyone up and get them excited. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, And and so I'm so glad I had that. Yeah. It's like without that reframing and recognizing that this is like something that is helpful. And I do want to say, I'm not like, I'm not saying medicine's horrible medicine ruined my life. No, like it was necessary. I wouldn't, 
I, I'm not going to say I would change my life and do it differently. Like, I don't know. And I also am not judging anyone for being medicated. There's power to medication and like, there is a time to use it. And like, I'm not saying like, everyone go ahead and quit what you're doing. Like everyone is on their own journey. That was personally mine. Um, so everyone has got to figure out, I don't want someone to like, listen to this and be like, Oh, well, Amanda stopped taking her ADHD medication. So I, mean, my parents were genuinely concerned with me driving a vehicle. Like they were like, she should not be on the road without her medication. Cause she could hurt someone like that was the very serious concern. Um, so I will not, you know, tout people that take medicine. I think there's benefits to it. Um, yeah. but for me, it was truly when I was allowed to step into my own power was when I stopped taking that and yeah. started looking at myself differently. Um, that that's, that's what, where the second part of what I was thinking was going <laughs> is that it in all sports, I, I believe, and in life, we have to embrace this unique part of us that we offer and you can, it's your weirdness. It's your, the weirdo mm -hmm. that's inside of you. Like as soon as you can embrace that, that's what just, blows your potential out of the water like it mm -hmm. just it really allows you when i started to do that for myself and i don't i still think i'm breaking some of the onion layers off mm -hmm. for yeah. me my my journey started when i i went and did my yoga teacher training because i did it at the U, i did it in hawaii i went on the big island in hawaii oh, nice. and i did it i was just there completely. it's beautiful yeah, I just went and immersed myself in an environment I had never been in before and in a cultural environment that I'd never been mm, in before. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I recognized at that moment, it was kind of when I really just started embracing who I was and, I, and I'd finished playing professional sport. I was still wrapped up in my ego as an athlete, a, a big mm. six foot three white male that was just <laughs> like had this ego with him and wouldn't do anything that didn't look right. And then, but inside there was this person that was screaming like, this is not you, let me out, let me, let me be. Mm -hmm. And I still think that's still working, still going to get there, yeah. but it felt so much better to just be able to go, right, this is how I want to do things in the world, how I want to be. And I'm, I'm okay with it. Don't, don't worry about what other people think. And and I feel like there was pretty divine timing there for your situation going through yeah. a yoga training. I love yoga. I, I practice every morning at just 20 minutes. I go through a flow of like breath work and movement and to just set my system for the day. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I think that time for you of like immersing in that yoga training experience was probably couldn't have been at a better moment as you were redefining and like relearning how you saw yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, Kind of like how I traveled to the Philippines after like being injured, like you too had another experience where it was like super immersive, different. And you were kind of like relearning, like figuring out who am I? Like, mm -hmm. I've only known myself in the context of this sport. Does this, am I like this in other areas of my life too? How does this carry over? How does my passion and like dedication to sport translate to outside of it? You know, we're like, we kind of know ourselves to be this person only through one environment. And until we like experience ourselves in like a much diverse, um, you know, world and, and then, you know, way of living that you see, mm, okay, I'm, I'm like, I'm still Amanda when I do these other things too. And if I can like really tap into like what made me a great athlete, such as like my ability to care, my indomitable spirit, like those are ingredients that I can take to everything. And that's like so much of my book, what my book is about is like tapping into like what our unique ingredients are. Even how I write my book, I write it with neurodivergency in mind. Like I don't, I've never read a book front to back. I, I want people to be bounced around and like it's to stimulate them and it, them to go through exercises and just like immerse in it because um, there's not one right way to read or one way to think or one way to be. And that's part of like the non-recipe way is like going through the kitchen in a way that works for you too. Like so much is about that. I think in life, we're like told you need to follow this, these instructions and these ingredients. And this is the way you need to do something. Mm -hmm. And like underpinning my whole book, like I'm using the kitchen as a metaphor. It's like, yeah. there's not just one way to do that. And like, there wasn't just one way for me to be and exist either. I'm like you said, peeling back the onions. I love a good food metaphor. I'm still doing that too. Like I'm still understanding like the impacts that had on how I think about myself, the way people treated me, um, the people that believed in me and like showed me what I was capable of and saw things in me that I didn't see in myself yet. Those were really key to like helping me recognize my strengths. And I don't think if I hadn't had those teachers and mentors that 
saw gifts in me that I wasn't yet seeing, I don't think I would be the same person as I am today. And when you like, don't have that belief in yourself, like you really need those people to help show that to you. Um, that's like the power of mentorship and teachers. There's a, I, yeah, having people bring that out of you, I think is powerful. Mm -hmm. There's something that I kind of have that and, but mostly at the moment, I kind of delving into some things myself. And one of the questions is I've been asking myself recently is how I is how I am impacting people in the way that I want. Mm -hmm. And that's more from the fact that is how I am in certain elements. There's some things that I am strong and confident that I'm doing really well in life. And I have that tucked away and I write that down and I I recognize it, I mantra it, I, I action it. But I'm also through trying to be better and develop and have this element of being able to deal with many different people in the world like we spoke about multi-diverse people that you can try and interact with in and, and in the sport I've had many different characters that I've had to deal with so a question I'm asking myself is what part of me am I is impacting people negatively like where is that impacting people negatively and can I change that not change it to make me a different person but to make me a better person I think that sometimes we can get scared about not trying to change an element of us through fear of, I don't know, being someone different and not, that's not really me. But I, I have these elements of myself where in certain situations I've recognized I want to change them through, because I don't feel they're serving people in the way that I want them to, to serve. I don't feel I'm impacting people. I don't feel I'm bringing across the best part of me in those moments. I feel like the word change is really scary for people. Mm. they're they're resistant to that but when I like look at it as evolution like you're simply evolving yourself like you're not shift you're not like changing you're just evolving into like the best version of yourself through self-awareness and like recognizing yeah. the way that we exist in this world does impact people whether we like it or not we can't help that and we can use that for good or we cannot and when we recognize those interactions and it takes noticing it and like it takes being held accountable and people being honest with you too of like how you made them feel. Um, speaking of which, I haven't shared this with anyone yet. For my birthday this year, I wanted to do something differently. And if you listen to Andrew Huberman, you might've heard his podcast on gratitude. Did you listen to the one on gratitude? I don't know if I have. Yeah. Okay. I will now. So it's really fascinating. Since I was in high school, I had a gratitude practice where every night before I'd go to bed, I'd write three things down that that I was just happy and grateful for that day. And very soon that turned into six and 10. And now it's like, I'm, it's hard to keep my list like under 20. Some days it goes on. But when you start noticing it and you start writing it down, you begin to see it more. But what was so fascinating in his podcast, he talks about how what is more potent and changes like the neural circuitry in our brain is not recognizing gratitude, but receiving it and through story and internalizing that gratitude. And often I think we exist in this world and we see ourselves differently than how other people see us. And I did this one really powerful exercise when I was in grad school and it was called our best self story. And I had to ask people as part of a personal branding class for like business school. And I had to ask people, can you send me a story when like you saw me as my best self and I sent it to old teachers and coaches and my friends. And I honestly, I wasn't like expecting anything out of it. I was just like, Oh, like, I hate to ask you this. Like I'm such a burden. Like, you know, we feel so bad asking people things. Right. I ended up getting pages long of stories that I still look at like five years later and I use it to reframe how I see myself sometimes and I'm being hard on myself. And and I recognize there is so such power in asking for people. And so what I'm doing this year for my birthday, you know, I hate asking people for things, but if someone wants to give me something, I want a story of when I positively impacted them and how it made them feel. Because if we can internalize that and read that story, we actually receive gratitude. And we only have to do like a minute of this a day to notice the benefits in this study. But we begin to change how we see ourselves and we can act more like that. And like, it can be as simple as that. Like if we want to change the world at start here, like I want to hear those stories because I'm sure I don't even realize the impact I've had on people. I feel like you'd like that. <laughs> I, oh, that's just so good. 
I and I really like it because funny enough, I have um in one of the drawers behind me is that I had a we did an exercise as a team once over here in the UK where we in the room we had, you know, those big sort of um sheets of paper, the flip chart piece yeah. of paper. Yeah. So it was a team building day and it was in the room. They were all around the room. They were literally like all on the walls. And each person, all all, one of our names was written on, everyone had their own chart and just everyone went round. And the idea was like what that person brings to the team, what that person brings. And, and there were so many things that were on mine that just I'd never really thought of at the time. And mm-hmm. and I've still got it now and I go back to it and I'm like, wow. these are pro athletes. These are guys that I really admired who were saying these things about me and that's how they feel. They weren't prompted because what happened was as you were doing it you covered the last one that was shown so you couldn't take from someone else so it had to be organic oh, and it was wow it was it was not copied or any and, and i i love that i love that one that you have just said there it's just so so good that's awesome i think yeah. it's an exercise we all need to do and and i'll admit this too i still keep all the sticky notes from practice when people would give me shout outs and like the letters that we'd write ourselves at the end of our season before champs meet. And it's not because I'm like hung up on like that person or like that experience, but I do want to remember who I was and how I made people feel. And like, that is the most human experience. It, it, I think that serves me to this day to like, remember, like I can be a leader. Like I am this person that shows up for other people. And I made people feel this way. Cause like when we go about our day to day, it's easy to forget about that. And it's like, mm-hmm. but like at the very core of it, like you were that person then, and and you still can have that impact on someone. And like, I want to leave the world feeling that it, it there's not like, there's nothing like more stripped down and to the core than someone telling you the way you made them feel, you know, they're not telling you about your performance at work. It's not about your time on the field or how you placed. It is like purely who you are as an individual. And like, when you take everything else away, that's all that is left. And so I want to remember those. Like, I want to be remembered for that too. And with everything that's happening in the world, we spent 20 minutes talking about it. Like, I think like if we can kind of ground ourselves in in that identity and that impact, we can like show up better and um, like step into who we are. Yeah, I think we spend so much time berating ourselves listening to the inner critic that we we need to to give the inner fan a, a megaphone that we need to hand them the mic for sure and do that more often but, <laughs> but amanda i'm cautious of time and and um thank you so much for for yeah. giving it I, i'm gonna there's so many things we could have covered it but i, I do ask this question to people and i feel like you listening to things like the andrew mm-hmm. huberman podcast you'll have something i'm sure and one of the questions <laughs> i ask is is there a book, a person, a quote, a podcast, a documentary that you are recommending a lot at the moment to people, to athletes, maybe even the athletes you work with? So I, I, I yeah, I, I love how you ask people that question on the podcast. And I was like, oh, no, like I don't really have the have perfect answer to this, sleep. right? <laughs> um, so there are so many times where I've received the podcast, the book, the quote I needed to hear that was necessary for that moment you know, and whether that is like the creative struggle I might be facing as a writer or, you know, uh, my athletic experience and like, you know, going into my pain cave and feeling comfort in that discomfort. It just depends on what I needed to hear in that moment. But I, I love the human podcast. I'm reading on women who run with the wolves right now. It's, it's a very heavy book, but it's really helping me like step into like my own essence and understand how like my creative powers and, and what I bring to this world is important. Um, but one quote that I do think is pretty universal that I actually had, re- I received a book by Wayne Dwyer when I was recovering from my hip surgery for my best friend's mom. And there was a quote in that book and the book is called how to change your mind. And it was, um, the quote said, when you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. And very ironically, like now I do like mindset work and all this stuff. I wasn't like ever thinking I was going to do that at the time, but I think like that we can all relate to that. We can all relate to a situation that maybe was undesirable or not what we wanted. And when we reframed what that situation was, it changed what we felt inside about that situation and it changed our perspective on it. And so throughout our entire life, we can do that. 
if we are in a situation that isn't ideal or is tough or we need to adapt, if we simply reframe how we see it, it changes the, our relationship to it. And it is as simple as that. And I think that quote, and anyone could use it. So I'll leave it at that. Wow. What an unbelievable way to to end it. Just before we finish, though, just unapologetically send people to find you in the right direction. Where do you want people to be sent if they if they come find you? So the easiest thing is following me on Instagram. I do share a good bit of my writing and like to like I think it's easy to connect with people and message with them on that. But I am trying to um, expand beyond social media platforms and doing more long form writing via newsletters um, and my blogging and obviously my book. And I think it, I love going through like long form email exchanges with people or writing letters or voice messages. I, I do think that's a much richer form of engagement. And so if they go to my website, amandapressgraves.com, they can subscribe to my newsletter um, or just message me on social media, on Instagram, and we can connect there and get started. And I'd just love to be able to share like the longer forms of my writing. I feel very limited sometimes with Instagram, but I do think that's a great starting point. Yeah. Well, links are in the show notes for people to find them. Thank you. And um, we'll set that all up. But Amanda, look, this has been unreal. I've loved this conversation. It's been so <laughs> Me too. cool. It's been Me so too. cool. Um, look, have a, uh, I just, again, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate Thanks. you coming on. I, I didn't know what to expect. And I love the direction this conversation has taken. For me, it's the middle of the day. It's the end of the day for you. I have so much energy to take into the rest of my day. And, and just, I loved learning from you as well. So thank you for your time and for having me and doing this work because it matters and it's important. I appreciate it. Thank you.